Good afternoon. I'm Caitlin McMurtry, a second year master's student in health policy and management and a Gund Fellowship recipient at the Harvard School of Public Health. It's a great privilege to introduce the Honorable U.S. Representative Raul Ruiz, a Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard Kennedy School alum from Coachella, California. I first had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Ruiz last year when he lectured on his time in Congress as part of Professor John McDonough's U.S. Health Policy course. As the son of farm workers and the first Latino to earn three professional degrees from Harvard, Dr. Ruiz has refreshingly deep insight into the challenges of graduate life at Harvard. Like his accomplishments, however, his road to Longwood and Cambridge was entirely unique. During the summer of 1990, long before Kickstarter, Dr. Ruiz old school crowdfunded his college tuition. Walking door to door through his desert town, he asked local businesses to invest in his education and by extension, their community. He made good on his promise in 2007 when after graduating magna cum laude from UCLA, earning an MD from Harvard Medical School, an MPP from Harvard Kennedy School, and an MPH from Harvard School of Public Health, he returned to work in Coachella Valley's only nonprofit hospital. Dr. Ruiz's work spans the globe, from El Salvador to Haiti, Mexico to Serbia, but his commitment to the 36th district and his hometown remains unparalleled. Using the skills and resources he acquired at Harvard, Dr. Ruiz has helped open a free clinic to serve vulnerable residents in the Coachella Valley, launched a pre-medical student mentorship program to increase the local supply of doctors, and championed a regional health initiative to improve healthcare access throughout the area. Before I turn the session over to Professor Michael Reich, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Congressman Raul Ruiz to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you. Congressman? Professor? Welcome home. Thank you. It's, uh, it's such a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you here. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Um, I've had the pleasure over the last several years of getting to know you, getting to know you and your friends, getting to know your family, seeing you in the district, uh, out in California in the desert, with your constituents, having you participate in my classes. Um, there's just so much that you have done and you have so much to offer. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to welcome you back here at, at this venue uh, to, to talk in a kind of personal, reflective way uh, about the path that you've chosen. It's, it's, a, it's a really unique, uh, but at the same time, extraordinarily important path because you've gone from the field of public health into the field of politics. Uh, one of the points that I've made here, some of my colleagues say repeatedly, um, is, is the importance of bringing politics into public health and bringing public health into politics. Um, and, and, and you've done that in, in your career. Uh, it's, it's just so impressive. You've gone from looking, dealing with medical emergencies um, to dealing with political emergencies. <laughs> and I'm, I'm definitely in a disaster zone, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I, just to start, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of, you know, wh why you did that. Absolutely. Wh why did you go from the ER to the um, halls of Congress? And, and, and what, how did you do it and what was it like? Thank you, Michael. And first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing and the leadership and the enormous, uh, uh, incredible ideas that have been implemented throughout the globe and that have improved the health of millions of people uh, and have saved millions of lives. So thank you for your leadership and, and your scholarly brain and your incredible ideas and the research that you do. And of course, the Harvard School of Public Health and all the students that are here, thank you for the invitation to be, uh, to be one of your speakers. You know, my story is a bit different than these other uh, folks that run for Congress and, and uh, 
uh, they alluded to it earlier in the introduction, is that I, I grew up in a very humble community of, of Coachella. It, it's humble with very little resources and very underserved. I, I lived in a trailer growing up with my older brother. We used to share the kitchen table as our bed at night, and it wasn't until my father was promoted to work in a packing house that we were able to um, move into the home where my mother still lives. Both my parents were farm workers, so you know we 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 grew up very humble. Uh, but so there is a strong sense of of connection with people and the communities and struggles. Uh, my community of Coachella is humble, but very, very rich with a sense of social responsibility, very rich with a sense of community, very rich in the sense of helping one another in order to make life a little easier for, for everybody else. And that's what I learned, especially from the farm workers and the ethic of hard work. Um, and uh, uh, growing up there, you know, my mother was the go-to person. Uh, who living in a trailer? The mother usually is. Yeah, and 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 people in the community would come to her, and 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 she would give advice, and she would help others. And mind you, I was I was a little boy at the time, and and my mother asked me, son, what do you want to what do you want to do when you grow up? And I looked at her and I said, mother, well, you know, what do you call people like you that help others? And she was smart. She said, a doctor. <laughs> a doctor, son. So ever since I was, I was you know, young, I wanted to be a doctor to help others. And in essence, that's the mission that led me to here. And many of you, that's the mission that leads many of you to Harvard School of Public Health, is to help other people, help other people live a better life, help serve so that you can improve the lives of your communities, your neighborhoods, your families, your countries, uh, the region, the globe, as we like to think globally at, at, at Harvard. And so that led me to uh, become a physician, become a public health specialist, uh, learn uh, some policy and strategic management from the Kennedy School, and go back home. So that's where I was uh, equipped with the skills from the School of Public Health uh, with those tools. But how did you decide to run for U.S. Congress from being an ER doc? Well, when I went back home, uh, the first place that I started doing public health work were in farm worker trailer parks. I started doing open air evening health education. And that was the time of H1N1. And as you know, uh, H1N1 uh, affects the, those that live in poverty, those that live in tight quarters. And these are trailer parks where two families live in a small trailer. and so you can imagine how intense the epidemic was in that area and I was taking care of them in the emergency department. So we went to the trailer parks and started doing community health work and education. We, I started helping organize a group of doctors that would come down to give free care, started leading uh, the healthcare initiative to address healthcare access barriers, and started mentoring students and created a program called Future Physician Leaders to, to help students from underserved areas primarily to come back home and, and serve in their communities because we have such a physician shortage crisis in the area. And when, when I'm out there, or when you're out there, you, you see the human face of failed policies. And they're not smiling. That's why you're out there to begin with. Uh, and so you, when you talk to a senior who's told me uh, that they went days without eating in order to save money to pay for their medicine, that's unacceptable. You know that. When you talk to your students that defer their dream of an education because they couldn't afford it and they have to work in the fields and constructions or the restaurants for a whole year just to pay for one more class, that's not acceptable. When you have working families, middle class, that are recently unemployed because of certain policies that middle class taxes are going up, but yet you know, income inequality is widening and the middle class is disappearing, that's, that's unacceptable. And my father always told me, son, never complain. Instead, be part of the solution. And the person that I was running against was voting on policies that would make it worse. And so as a physician, as a public health expert, as someone who wants to improve the health of the communities that I care deeply about, 
as somebody who wants to take care of my patients, knowing that health is not just a transaction between a, fish, a physician and a doctor with a pill, a med, a, with medicine, that it also deals with community health. And when you look at community health, it's the social determinants of health whether or not there's clean water, whether, whether or not uh, our kids are graduating from high school, whether or not we have safe streets, we have enough uh, healthy uh, grocery markets in, uh, in your community, um, safety in the home. Uh, those are the issues that we need to address in order to improve the health of your individual patient and also of the community. And so it was a natural pro progression for me to run for Congress in order to be part of the solution and address the health of the community and my patients. So how did people react when you said, <laughs> I'm running for Congress, Ex excuse me? Yeah, well, that's, an in that's interesting because most people said that, um, that there was no way on earth that I would win. I was running against a 14-year incumbent, uh, rock star last name, uh, literally, and, uh, and had a lot of resources. And here I was, never ran for office, nor did I ever participate in a campaign before. And, uh, but I said I, w I was gonna do it because I knew that that was a toolbox, a way to make change in the community that I needed uh, uh, to do. And so when I said I was running, a lot of people said, there's no way you're gonna win. In fact, there's some people in my own party uh, locally that looked at me and said, there's no way you're gonna win. And by the way, who the hell do you think you are? Why don't you wait your, your turn in line and run for school board and the assembly or the state senate like everybody else, and then run for, then run for Congress. And you know, I looked at them and I looked at them in the eye and I said, with all due respect, uh, I don't have to ask permission to serve the community. And so I decided to run. It's, it's an incredible story, Raul. How, how did you win? What happened? Well, I, you know, <laughs> that's, you know it's, it's interesting. I, um, I invited a, a demographer down to talk about my chances. I'm a numbers guy, I'm science, you know, I'm a physician. So they looked at, they looked at how Jerry Brown, the governor, did, and how Obama did in that in that district, and the previous senators, and the guy that ran uh, um, before me. And he closed the book, and he looked at me, and he says, "I have to be honest with you. You have a five percent chance of winning." And I looked at him, and I said, "So you mean I can win?" <laughs> So we took a, a 5% chance of winning into a 6% uh, victory. And the way we did that is, uh, is, first, is you get people who are talented and skilled in what they do, and you bring in great advisors and people that have, have think like uh, 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 political strategists, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then, in my case, we built coalitions. We built coalitions um, between different communities, uh, and I believe that the time was, was right and the issues were right uh, in terms of you know, protecting Medicare for our seniors, uh, Social Security for our seniors, to make sure that, that uh, we strengthen the middle class by strengthening job creation through small businesses, uh, to make sure that we provide the assistance that our students need, uh, not only in financial assistance, but also in the assistance of creating high quality, lower cost, uh, high quality uh, educational opportunities for them. And, uh, and everybody came together and, and we won. Well, we're just so happy that you won. Uh, it's, it's an incredible story. I think it's a credit to your uh, hard work, dedication, positive attitude, this kind of eternal optimism, um, and, and, uh, and really your drive to connect with the people in your district um, at, at many different levels. Um, of course, you know, doing politics these days in Washington is not a lot of fun. We've sort of gone from a country that's uh, uh, bipartisan to a country that's bipolar. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it sometimes seems like, like Washington is just so totally dysfunctional um, that we don't need emergency room docs, we need psychiatrists. <laughs> well, how, what's, it, what's it like working in Congress today and how, how, do, you, how do you survive and, and how, do you get, what, 
how do you get things done? What do you think you've, this is now two years, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, what are your achievements? Well, thank you for asking, Michael, and Congress definitely needs emergency physicians uh, because that's where our national emergency is occurring right now. Uh, in fact, uh, as you remember, I specialized in disaster aid uh, right here at Harvard School of Public Health, and so I, I like to tell people that I'm in our, our nation's largest man-made disaster uh, and trying to really make some sense uh, of it. But one of the things that we need to realize, and this is something that I've carried with me all along, is the idea of creating the change that you want to see is taking ownership of the issue and wanting to do something about it. Uh, taking that initiative by getting out of your comfort zone and doing something about it. We've, we've talked a lot about hope these last several years and, and hope is, is absolutely necessary for us to get things accomplished because we need to believe in the change, we need to believe in ourselves to make that change. But hope without strategy is just hope. A vision without implementation is just a vision. And politics is the, the art of idea and the wars of ideas making uh, and the struggle of which idea would change. And policy is the sport, is the implementation of those ideas that we need to pursue. And so you can implement those ideas through policy or through coalition, through leadership building in your communities, through bringing people together at the table to, to organize and to create the change uh, back home. So I believe that the, the change is on all of us, that the responsibility is on all of us as individuals in this great uh, experiment of democracy that, we, that we're leading uh, the way, that it will only work if you get involved. It will only work if you participate. And your voice will only be heard if you speak. And if you don't speak, then your voice is going to remain silent. And so that's what we do in the community, where solutions begin at home. We don't wait for an act of Congress, that we start to implement uh, solutions. For example, we've started a veterans university in our home district. We're recruiting physicians to contract with the VA so that our veterans don't have to wait uh, to be seen when they need it, like uh, many have, have, have waited, uh, especially around Phoenix. Uh, we have really uh, sponsored a lot of um, senior workshops. We've created tools and capacity for our uh, constituents to really identify uh, what are their main issues, but also come together as a community to work on those issues. The bottom line is create your opportunities. Don't wait or expect an opportunity to come your way. If none exist, you create it. So, Raul, um I know you're a great fan of measurement from your time at the Kennedy School and the importance of measurement in thinking about performance. So I'd like to ask you a kind of self-reflective question. If, when you think about your own performance, um, how do you measure the performance of a politician two years in office? You know, I mean, ultimately, in some ways, the, the ultimate measurement is November 4th. 53 days from now, mm -hmm. what happens in the election, where it's mm -hmm. a nice count. Mm -hmm. um, academics sometimes measure performance by numbers of publications. Yeah. I think that that measurement uh, is, has been utilized a lot for career politicians uh, who seem to want to run for office for their own personal benefit. And once they win, they're thinking about what's the next best thing for them. What other title can they achieve? What other uh, political position can I jump from uh, and towards in order to progress uh, in my own career? Whereas if you're a public servant uh, and a leader, then that measurement becomes the quality of life of the people that you serve. And that's the measurement that all of you are very familiar with. You know. Uh, the unemployment rate, uh, the high school graduation rate, uh, the amount of jobs that, uh, that are created um, with, your, uh, with your assistance. Uh, and those are the quality of life measures that public health students, of course, and experts are, are very 
are very fond of. Be and that's what I hold myself accountable to and I hold my office accountable to, is not only how we perform and, and look at the data, because if you can't count it, you can't improve it, uh, and then, but more importantly is the outcome. We're a very mission-driven office, um, and our mission is very, very simple. It's, it's to uh, be a constituent-centered team that pursues excellence in public service in order to improve and inspire the lives of the people we serve. There's no, there's no ounce of uh, partisanship or political ideology. It's pragmatic. It's about problem solving. It's about working uh, at the highest standard in order to improve the lives of the people we serve. And we've implemented structures in our office in order to measure those outcomes. Uh, and we've also implemented structures in our office to reach uh, across the aisle and work with Republicans and uh, identify those that are in the middle, uh, like myself, that are willing to work together to create the change that we want uh, for America. And we need more of that in Congress these days. The problem is that we've moved into an ideological war based on theory and, uh, and ideology. The solution is to put people above partisanship and solutions above ideology and work pragmatically to create those uh, solutions and implement them in, uh, throughout the country. Great. Well, um, we have time now for questions from the audience. So if there are people who would like to ask questions, raise your hands. Okay, we'll start one here, then second here. So if you would like to. Uh, is it working? Yes. Hello. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Leo. I'm a fellow here at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, so I'm, I have a similar background. I am uh, also a physician. I'm Latino, and I was brought up, you know, in, in under a resource uh, scarcity environment. So my question for you is, uh, you know, after the passage of the ACA, one of the main problems and my you know, a main preoccupation is the 10 million Latino individuals who live in this country who actually are not enrolling at the rate that we would expect them to enroll. So mm -hmm. I would like to get an opinion from you um, about that issue and how can we actually improve, um, you know, the, the, the life of these populations and other minorities as well. Very good. Thank you for that question, Leo. Um, and. Uh, California, no doubt, is leading the country in terms of en enrollment. Uh, and within California, my district is one of the top districts in terms of enrollment as well. We're, we're over 200% goal of enrolling individuals that have never been insured uh, or that have been disc uh, discriminated against because they have diabetes or a child with cancer. Uh, so, and one of the ways we did that, and it's, there's a lot of the new enrollees are Latino, and the ways we did that is by, by building a uh, collaborative on the ground with different organizations. Uh, and uh, we had three goals within the office, which was to make sure there's communication, uh, and they were inclusive and comprehensive, that they developed their own goals with metrics that they would be held uh, accountable to. Uh, and three, that the, we would constantly debrief and talk about methods that work and don't work. And so when you have that kind of structure, it helps lead you to high performance. But one of the things that we found is that uh, if you don't put your resources where your mouth is, then it's going to be very difficult. And we see around the country that there's been hesitation to uh, put their resources in Spanish uh, media you know, in different outlets where Spanish-speaking communities listen uh, to the news, they get their information. That's one. Two is that our communities with low resources and, and uh, uh, don't have a local clinic. They don't have um, uh, the outreach as other people do. So we have to use non-traditional ways of, of, of reaching uh, the community through churches. Uh, it's a very grassroots organizing method, uh, but also the health promoters, the promotoras, with organizations like the Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, et cetera, that really get out there uh, and use peers 
to educate peers and enroll peers in their homes. And that's something that re can really work and we need to invest in those uh, non-traditional methods of, uh, of enrollment. You know, I brought down uh, the director of Covered California from uh, Sacramento to Coachella. And the, the church uh, where we had the workshop uh, was packed. And he gave a PowerPoint presentation on how to utilize the website to enroll in health insurance and what are the different benefits and if you qualify or not. And then this campesino, this farm worker, stood up and he raised his hand. He was very respectful and very polite. And he, and he said, sir, you're, you're, this is a great presentation and I love the, the different slides, but we don't have computers at home. And then even if they did, there's no internet. There's no Wi-Fi in, those in certain communities. So you have to think through these things and match your modality with the communities and the resources that are available with them. And if you're going to completely rely on web-based enrollment, uh, then you're going to reach a certain population and not others. Not to mention the challenges of working in districts where the congressman may not view this as a priority. Which part? In other districts, Raul. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> not yours. Okay. Whoa. I... Other districts. <laughs> I was like, whoa, no, 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 yes. What do we do in other, you know, this in... brings us back to politics. Well, that... it's, you're right, and that's why it's so important to, to get engaged because, you know, our, our mantra here is to improve the health of a population. And you must do that in, w through education, uh, through access, uh, and the Affordable Care Act's goal is just that. And there's been some great improvements, but it's not perfect. There are some flaws. And we need to keep the good, change the bad, fix the bad, and we need to get rid of the ugly. And, uh, and the focus shouldn't be utilizing the Affordable Care Act as a Polit political ideological football uh, to score political gamemanship points. But the point now should be to modify it, make it better, and move on, and be pragmatic in your fixes. Good. We'll take a second question. Yes, sir. You, uh, you can stand up and oh, stand identify, up. Okay. identify yourself. I'm Dr. Lawrence Cohn, a cardiac surgeon from a neighborhood hospital, the Bergman Women's Hospital. You might have been there when you were a medical I student. Was. Yeah. Did I treat you okay? Yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really admire what you've done. Your message is terrific. I looked you up on the internet yesterday, and I think you're near a, another town called Palm Springs and Palm Desert. Yes. It has some very affluent people in that, those mm -hmm. communities, because I was a California native, so I, I went there, you know. Uh, how does your message resonate with those, shall we say, more affluent parts of that area that you're a Congress uh, person representing, because I think your message is terrific, but I just was curious how it resonated with that area there. It resonated uh, well enough for me to win by six percent. But but here's 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 the role here's the role of um, of a representative is to represent the people that they serve. It's not those that are ideologically aligned with you, those that live in your city. I represent Republicans. I represent independents. I represent Democrats. I represent the affluent. I represent the indigent. I represent seniors, and I represent the young. And that's how we were able to win the, our election, because everybody uh, found a venue to have a voice uh, in our great democracy and be represented. So we have great disparity in my district. We have um, very affluent uh, individuals uh, and we have very indigent individuals. And the, there are affluent individuals that are very socially responsible, that lead the country in philanthropy and that are doing amazing work throughout the districts to help, uh, to help uh, the indigent and those striving for the middle class and the middle class uh, live a better life. And I, and I absolutely enjoy working with them as well. And so we need to make sure that, that when we do have these different, um, are they paging you, doctor? <laughs> I think they're, 
I think I think they're 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 Cardiac paging. patient yeah. requiring <laughs> Uh, so that's uh, and and so I think that that what what the American people, uh, the affluent indigent, and what we're based out of uh, as a country is to make sure that we continue to have opportunities, opportunities that are fair, uh, that we make sure that we live the values of pursuing excellence with personal responsibility. All of us are responsible uh, for our own actions and and for our own future. Uh, but also to make sure that we never forget what makes our country great, and that's service with social responsibility. That's realizing that there's something greater than, than us as individual, and that's the greater good, the idea of America, the idea that in this country my story could be told, that in this country a child of farm workers who grew up in a trailer can uh, come to a university like Harvard uh, with hard work uh, and utilize the toolbox and the education uh, in the public realm. And believe you me, I've incorporated the, uh, the skills uh, that, you, that I've learned here in the classroom out in the field of, of politics and public health and medicine. So this is American democracy at work. It's, it's, it's really an incredible story. And um, I had the, the privilege of being at your local inauguration. Um, uh, and it, it was a boys, boys and Girls Club. Yeah, it was. And it was in like a, a, a large gymnasium, simple place. And uh, it was packed because people were thrilled that someone was in Congress to represent them. And, and they had, as, as part of that, they had like the middle school band playing, <laughs> slightly out of tune. They were good. They were they good. Were, they were good. They were good. I shouldn't be critical. They were, they were really great. <laughs> and, and there was this huge line of people waiting to, to congratulate you and have their picture taken. It was just, it was uh, heartwarming. So I would urge you, uh, go out to the district. January is a good time. <laughs> and. Uh, is it? Well, I mean, you know, I, I would like to urge everyone to participate. I would like to urge everyone to make that leap from the generation of ideas to the implementation of ideas by pursuing uh, decision-making influence, whether it's through the par participating in politics and democracy, uh, in campaigns, in uh, briefings uh, for those that can make decisions, or better yet, become a decision maker yourself at any level of government, whether it's in your school board or your healthcare districts in your hometowns or whether it's uh, in your city council or, or regional or state. But if you don't speak, you don't have a voice. Because in order to, to have a voice, you need to speak. So that's the uh, a key here. Good. Let's take uh, another question. We'll go. Why don't we take two or three questions, Raul, since we have lots of people, and then Abs we'll give absolutely. you uh, Yes. Hi, my name is Jeff Reynoso. I'm a first year in the new uh, Doctor of Public Health Leadership Program um, that just started and launched this year. Um, I want to go to one of your comments uh, about um, diversity in the healthcare professions. Um, I think that's one of the great challenges that we have in our public health and healthcare systems, the lack of representation of people of color. Um, and particularly this notion, so Dean Frank talks about the four functions of a health system, this notion of stewardship. Um, in relation to the, I feel the lack of representation in the healthcare system is a failure of the education um, system in this country. So um, I would like to uh, just hear some thoughts about your comments of what, as public health and healthcare professionals, um, how can we use our um, ability of stewardship to um, connect with other sectors to improve these outcomes? Good, let's take two more. Other people who would like to, let's go over here. Hi, my name is Idalid Ivy Franco. I'm a fourth year medical student at the Harvard Medical School and also um, this is my first year at the MPH school. So you're not sleeping much. I don't sleep ever. <laughs> I think sleep is for after you're dead. 
Um, and so my question is, growing up, I had a similar background. I grew up in, um, I was born in Mexico, came here when I was two, um, grew up in La Puente, which was, you know, there was a lot of gang violence, there was a lot of other things, but one of the things that, you know, impacted me was I was undocumented. Um, and so knowing with the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot of money that's being taken away from the safety net hospitals. Um, and so, you know, how immigration uh, reform plays into healthcare, and especially in Coachella, where there's also, I'm assuming, a lot of undocumented um, individuals. How we can address the issues of public health within those communities, because um, a lot of those people, you know, have been here for 20, 30, 40 years, and this is their home. This is where they've worked. This is where they've paid their taxes, gone to school. So, how can we address the health issues of the undocumented communities? Good. We'll take one more here in the center. If you can pass some microphone. Hello, uh, Eric DeFreitas. I'm an MPH student here at the School of Public Health. This past year, uh, DOD medicine has kind of been in the news in the negative sense. Uh, the command group at Womack was relieved, and this past summer, there were two articles in the New York Times about p medical uh, mistakes and poor outcomes at military treatment facilities. As a congressman, do you have any thoughts on that or legislative action that might result? Good. Raul is on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Yeah. So he does have something to say about that. Good. So why don't we take your answers, Good responses to Yeah, you? absolutely. Listen, the focus uh, regarding the question of diversity in the workforce, it's, it's very important, but it's not, it's not the necessarily the diversity that you're, that you're looking for. It's, it's to make sure that the patients receive and understand uh, the treatments and the programs that's available to them and figuring out how can you best convey that information, convey that, uh, that treatment. So uh, the, the term now that we use is cultural sensitivity, not cultural competency, because you can't learn everything about everybody, but how do you become sensitive to people's cultures and backgrounds and whatnot? And it's, it's common uh, sense to, to know that somebody who comes from that community somebody who can understand and speak the language of that community uh, is going to better be able to prescribe the appropriate treatment modality. Uh, if you go into a low-income community and, and you recommend them to uh, eat uh, certain uh, vegetables, uh, go to join a gym uh, and exercise when, or walk outside uh, in as much as possible, uh, you, and, but you don't realize that there are no paved streets or roads, that there are no gyms, and that this person can't afford the type of vegetables that you're recommending, and, and they can't afford to go to the gym, then you know that the success rate and implementation is not going to, uh, to work, and your treatment modality is going to fail. So it's very important that when you have a country as diverse as ours, that the providers are as diverse in order to best, in order to have the best outcomes with our patients. So yes, that, uh, that's very important that we do that. Uh, and what we have to look at is to create pipelines of, of professionalization and professionalism uh, into certain careers that will eventually lead them back into those communities. Okay, uh, in terms of the residual uninsured, the residual uninsured continues to, uh, to lack services, uh, education, edu uh, health education. And now more than ever, we realize the importance of passing comprehensive immigration reform. Now we, is the importance of passing the, for example, a version of the Senate bill that got that was passed in a bipartisan fashion that would improve our economy, that would reduce our deficit by $800 billion, that would improve our economy, provide a stable workforce for many of our industries, agriculture, tourism, restaurants, constructions that rely heavily on immigrant labor, uh, and also reduce the burden of disease in our country. Uh, and uh, comprehensive immigration reform is the way to, to do that. And so we're still gonna continue to advocate for comprehensive immigration reform. And in terms of the Department of Defense, this is where we really need to transform not only the VA system, but the Department of Defense uh, medical system uh, into a high quality patient-centered, veteran-centered or, or um, uh, service man or woman-centered uh, uh, care. 
And the way you do that is to hold people accountable. To hold people accountable based on metrics that amplify the voice and the importance of the outcomes in health and the quality of care that our veterans and that our servicemen and women receive in those institutions. One of the things that, that I did um, early on was I met with a representative, Chris Gibson. He's a, a commander in, in the 82nd Airborne. And I had lunch with him, and one of my uh, attempts to really get to know those that might have different opinions uh, and ideas than me uh, to see where our common ground was. Where it turned out that our common ground was actually in Haiti. Uh, I was one of the first responders in Haiti after the earthquake, and he was the commanding officer for the 82nd Airborne in Haiti. And I went with uh, the actor Sean Penn uh, with JPHRO and I became his medical director and managed the largest internally displaced camp in all of Port-au-Prince. There are about 60,000 Haitians living under sheets and sticks. And, uh, and we worked closely with the 82nd Airborne with striker teams going to remote areas and providing care uh, in places where the care was, was uh, that they had not seen a, a, a provider, uh, places where seniors were still laying on the ground for days in their own excrement because they had a hip fracture. Or, you know, young uh, women were uh, in their makeshift tents uh, immobilized because they had a spine fracture and urinating blood and most likely ruptured their kidneys because of some concrete block landing landing on them. So we were out there in the trenches and worked really well with the logistics experts. And so we were sitting down in lunch and said, you know, Chris, we were able to save lives in, in Haiti together. So we're in Congress now. Why don't we work together to improve the lives of our veterans? And we shook on it and we introduced the 21st Century uh, Healthcare for Heroes Act, which would combine the medical records from the VA with the Department of Defense. So that not only was there better improvement in care between the different agencies, but our veterans no longer had to wait years to get their medical records to process their claims, but now they can do it with a click of a mouse and that parts of those bills were incorporated in, in other bills that passed and became law. Good, let's take another three questions. People who'd like to ask a question. One, two, three, thank you. One here, right here. Yes. Sorry, right, See, stand up. Needs a mic. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Martin Escandon. I'm a student here at the School of Public Health, and I wonder if you could share with us a story about a patient you had back home who kind of exemplifies the social determinants and barriers to getting quality health care that are there in Coachella. Absolutely. Good, thank you. Second question back here, if you can. Hi, my name's Yuli, and I'm a first year master's student in the Department of Epidemiology. And uh, my question for you is, um, although you have worked in a nonprofit hospital, uh, you finally chose to go to the Congress. So I'm just wondering, have you ever thought to go to a nonprofit organization, or you believe the politics is the ultimate only solution? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And there was a third one. Hello, my name's James. I'm a student on the MPH program here. Um, you talked quite a lot. I thought it was very interesting. You talked about political deadlock and the difficulty of working with people who are very um, kind of ideologically motivated, like that's the place they're coming from. I just kind of wonder what your thoughts are and what some of the, the, uh, the strategies are for kind of bringing people who are very ideologically motivated round to the, the view that, you know, the important view that the way forward is a kind of more pragmatic approach. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start with, with yours. Um, and one of the things that I did in my office was to instruct and encourage my staff to meet with their counterparts in, for example, a Republican office. So that my uh, LD would speak to an LD from a Republican office legislative director and <laughs> my chief of staff would speak to other chief of staffs so that we got to know each other. 
One of the problems is that uh, if you approach somebody already as your ideological enemy, then you don't have communication. But if you approach somebody as Americans who are here for, for uh, noble reasons to, to help give of oneself uh, for the greater good and the community and for our country, then you start to build that uh, commonalities. And once you start to understand what is their interest, what are their interests, and you find those connections, then you're able to work together to find those bills, to know what, let's not focus on the extreme perimeters, but let's focus uh, within the confidence interval. Let's focus within the bracket, right, of, of what is doable, what is, what is probable, and what we, can, what we can get accomplished. And that's been working really well with us um, and, uh, and in Congress. So I think, you know, one of the um, strategies that Raul uses that he even just mentioned in the previous story about, what was his name? Uh, Chris Gibson. Chris Gibson is uh, building relationships of trust. So building relationships of trust across offices, across people, across organizations, that provides you with uh, one way for trying to find areas of commonality uh, across ide ideological, ideological gaps. And I think you know, that's one of the challenges uh, in, in today's Congress is that the polarization is so far that uh, it, it's, it's hard to find uh, opportunities to build bridges. Mm -hmm. But they're there. And there's groups like um, No Labels that I'm a part of that are a committed group of over 80 uh, representatives that will meet uh, periodically to get to know one another to find those commonalities and to come up with pragmatic solutions. So it's working, uh, little by little. But I am very frustrated uh, with the pace. As an emergency medicine doctor, I like to see results right now. Uh, and, and so I, I'm practicing patience like never before. This is more like chronic care. <laughs> yeah, no, this is more like disaster medicine. Uh, in terms of your uh, question as to whether or not uh, I would have considered nonprofit, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, you got to see this as a spectrum of toolboxes that are uh, at your disposal. And sometimes uh, you'll be surprised that if you get out of your silo uh, and venture into uncharted territories, you'll realize that your skills and talents may be useful in other realms. In our, uh, our country, there's many ways to influence change and, and to uh, make that change happen for, for the great ideals that, that, that you have and for the people you want to serve. Um, there's the grassroots rate, uh, uh, way. The, the civil rights movement was a clear example of, of hundreds and thousands of people and millions of people uh, organizing to, to get policies put into place. Okay. Then there's the financial route where you uh, become very f successful financially and start a foundation. Uh, the Bill Gates in the world uh, can uh, completely reduce uh, health care, uh, uh, the, uh, the health care crises that I have in my district. One person with one check to an organization can increase the amount of physicians, uh, clinics, uh, and the services that are uh, available. And then there's the decision makers who work with larger budgets and more resources and uh, that can really make the change that everybody's looking for. Uh, and so I would encourage you to really work with the decision makers because the public health dilemma is that they're dependent upon the funding uh, through foundations and governments uh, to do the work that they do. The dilemma with the public health is that you have the wonderful ideas that will change the world, that will uh, completely improve the lives of millions around the globe, but you need the authorization, right? You need the policies and you need the, the resources to implement those. Who makes those decisions? The policymakers, the leaders in, of government, uh, and those that are in, in international 
uh, organizations that either were appointed or uh, ran for the office and now are, are the directors of, of you know, the World Bank or IMF and, and World Health Organization. And that's important to understand. And that's why it's so important, uh, the work that uh, Professor Reich is doing at Harvard and others is so important because we need to make that, that leap from our comfort zone of epidemiology, of research, of, of uh, oral rehydration therapy in underserved communities, of um, you know, making sure that, uh, that we have the right questions in play and, and the answers into how can I ensure that these ideas get accepted and implemented that will improve and save lives. There was one more question about a case. Yes. So that um, exemplifies the kinds of challenges that people in your district confront. Absolutely, a 55-year-old woman uh, came to me in the emergency department uh, f with uh, hemorrhaging um, uh, from below, and uh, she was previously seen at a, at a different hospital. Uh, and once they found that she was uninsured, they said, "Go to county," uh, and. Uh, County Hospital was about an hour and a half and she was still actively bleeding. And so it was, it was a very difficult situation and one of the nurses, thank God for nurses, you know, told, uh, told that patient, no, 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 there's a different, there's a hospital nearby, I don't think you should go to, to County. So she came to me and she was bleeding and she was afraid and, uh, and she was uninsured. Uh, and so I uh, managed to get her admitted into my hospital. Uh, and to stop the bleeding, but she needed the workup. Uh, and uh, you can imagine the fear in her eyes, and you can imagine the, 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 the differential diagnosis that comes uh, with a, uh, a woman no longer in child-bearing uh, age that uh, you know, postpartum bleeding can bring. You, know, you think of cancer, of course. And uh, sure enough, she had uh, cervical cancer. And because she was uninsured, she had never done a pap smear, she had never done uh, any kind of preventative medicine uh, that would have detected this early on and could have saved her life. And I say saved, could have saved her life because six months later she died. So that's a case where uh, people uh, who experience these failed policies uh, are not smiling. So that's a sobering uh, example. I think just as a footnote, as Raul was telling that story, he went along and said, thank God for nurses. Uh, one of our commonalities, in, in addition to both being concerned about public health and politics, is that <laughs> we're both married to nurses. Yeah. So I, thank God for nurses, no, no, a very no. personal, <laughs> you know, practical problem solving when the doctors aren't oh, quite yeah. sure what to do. They, they, they know exactly Absolutely. what needs to be done. Absolutely. I'm, I recently got married in, in March, and she's a, the love of my life, and I've never been happier. Uh, and it's been an incredible experience, uh, and it's an incredible life uh, living it with her. She's a nurse and a five-time world champion. Uh, black belt karate in the men's league. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the smile. <laughs> so you don't mess with Monica. Um, Raul, as, as uh, there are students here, there are students watching, um, as you look back on your career, which was, didn't follow a linear path, what, what is your recommendation for students as they think about their next steps? One is never give up on your purpose and your dreams, no matter how difficult, no matter how uh, lacking you are in the resources to do that. Two is never ask permission to implement those dreams and serve the community. Three is to get out of your comfort zone. Get out of what you think might be safe because it's your routine and challenge yourself with new experiences and new ventures to make the difference. And finally, don't ever wait or expect an opportunity to come your way. If none exists, create it. And um, what are your thoughts about solving the problems of political gridlock? Elect people who are more pragmatic 
<laughs> solution oriented. Uh, this is democracy. If you're sick and tired of it, you have every right to run as well and to make that difference and to elect individuals that you believe will be for the people, uh, from the people, uh, and will work by the people. So that way we can make sure that elected officials put people above partisanship and solutions above ideology. So it's, uh, it's, it's been great uh, having Raul with us today. Um, it's been great having the opportunity to welcome him back to the School of Public Health. Um, for the last couple of years, um, I teach a class on politics and policy. I Skype Raul in to talk to the students. It's a class of about 60 people. Uh, to give them a sense of what I say is, this is our congressman. You know, from, from the School of Public Health, um, representing public health in the US Congress, trying to find real solutions that will work, uh, that can be adopted and um, accepted by people with different values, different views about the future, but that will make tangible improvements uh, to the lives of some of the worst off people in the country, in his district, and um, is looking for paths forward uh, that, that really will make a difference. It really gives me faith in the system uh, that someone like this can, can make the leap of faith, because it really was a bold leap of faith, uh, uh, out of the ER into the rough and tumble world, uh, and it's not easy, of electoral politics, uh, of, of building up a staff, of walking around in his district, shaking people's hands, uh, going up to meet people that he doesn't necessarily agree with to uh, find areas and, and restore faith that uh, we really can find solutions to some of the tough problems of our lives. So um, I'd just like to say thank you so much. Well, thank you for your friendship, Michael, for your advice, uh, your mentorship, and everything that you do for, for me, my constituents, and for the students here at Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you so much. My pleasure.